All the Way with Stephanie K. <laughs> I had Nicole Stoffman, who played Stephanie K, uh, do a phone interview with me. We had a great chat about her experience on Degrassi and, you know, what she's been up to since then. And it was just awesome to have her on. I've been talking to her for a bit about uh, doing this interview, so it was nice to get it done over the holidays. Hopefully, periodically, I'll have cast members return and do short interviews just like this one and it was awesome to have her on uh i've had a pretty great holiday sorry for anyone who is missing the podcast we did not release one over the uh christmas day kind of week there yeah christmas day it fell on it so i was like that's what i said that's the sound i make when i'm not sure if i should uh put out a podcast it's very that's the sound apparently (laughs) i had a great christmas though i was at my parents in collingwood then an awesome new year's my birthday is january 1st so i had a great birthday and new year's combo with my girlfriend here in toronto we had a great time then i slept like all day yesterday i think i was up for like four to six hours total on my birthday Uh, i just pretty much went to facebook and took solace in people wishing me a happy birthday, talked to my parents again, and it was uh, pretty much the best birthday ever, I'd say. All you really want to do is recover from New Year's on the 1st. It just happened to be my birthday, and it was great. Um, For dates, what do I got coming up? I am in Kingston on January 7th at the Absolute Comedy Club there. That show starts at 830 it's the Pro-Am night. Should be a really great show. It's $5, I think, to get in there. It's a great time in Kingston. I love going doing that club every couple months. So uh, come check that out if you're near the Kins- Kingston in Kingston. If you're in the Kingston area there in Kingstown, come on out to that absolute comedy. I guess this is kind of also the season one recap episode. We, you know, I felt that um, Nicole's character, Stephanie, was the main character in season one. It starts with a story on her, ends the season with a story about her, basically, you know, dealing with that new image that she set up all through season one. Pretty much most of the episodes, I would say, have a Steph story, like Kiss Me Steph, obviously, the big dance, Um, she's in that one. The experiment, even, it's more of an Arthur one, but she's part of that. Uh, the cover up, no. Uh, Great Race, she's featured a little bit in it. She talks about wearing a swimsuit, which would have been a campaign promise. She said, you know, she would be in a bikini at some point, but she was not. Uh, Rumor has it, not really. Best Laid Plan, she features prominently in that one with, uh, Playing to have sex with wheels, doesn't pan out. Nothing to fear, not really. What a night, but she's in that break time. Smoke screen, not really. It's late, not really. Parents night, not really. But big time revolution. So I would say, you know, like, you know, six out of these 13 episodes feature Stephanie Gates. She's definitely the main character. I think she was the perfect, perfect uh, real life counterpart to have on to go over these things in season one. Next week, we're going to be back with um, Season 2, Episode 3, which is a really good episode. I remember this one's kind of come up a lot when we've been talking to people, especially coming off the heels out of A a Helping Hand, which was another pretty great episode. This one's Great Expectations, and it's the debut of the character Liz, who, you know, many people, I think she resonates pretty well. She becomes Spike's best friend. She's a big character on the show, so that'll be a good one. And it starts off with her having a crush on Joey. She really likes Joey, so it's uh, it's funny. It's funny because he's kind of had a lot of unrequited love in the show so far, mostly with uh, with Steph. So it's interesting to see someone be into him until he messes it up. We'll get into that episode next week, and yeah, let's get to the interview with Nicole. Let's go back to Degrassi. Nicole speaking. 
Hey, Nicole. This is Tim calling. Hi, Tim. How are you? Very good. Good to hear from you. Great to hear from you. Uh, thank you very much for doing this uh, doing this little interview with me. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Uh, you having good holidays and all of that? Yes, I just got back from Vancouver, and uh, um, after I get off after after we after I get off the phone with you, I'll be having breakfast because oh, are you still on <laughs> Vancouver <jet-lined>. time. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's but yeah, good. my parents are living in Vancouver, so I was out there visiting them mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. running on the beach and eating sushi. It was great. Oh, a perfect Christmas. Dream Christmas, right? Sushi and the beach. Yes. yes. <laughs> Although I always like to assert Canada's multiculturalism policy and tell people that I don't celebrate Christmas because I'm Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> so we had Hanukkah, and, uh, which was great, too, because if you forget, if you think of something to buy somebody... You have eight days to, to get it for <laughs> To recover from it. <laughs> That's right. So I guess, um, you know, since, um, since like the, I mean, early 90s, you kind of changed gear and you got much more into music and also to poli sci as well, right? Yes, I've been, I've been uh, exploring. <laughs> as <laughs> we all do. Say, exploring my interests. Had, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to ask, like, has has the show, like, uh, have people mentioned that you were on the show over those years? They have, um, and it, it really surprised me uh, how that show lived on in people's hearts and minds. And I have to admit, because, I, because this whole thing happened as I was going through adolescence myself. Of course. I think my first reaction was a bit immature. My first reaction was uh, that I was annoyed, and I felt pestered. And then one day... Uh, an aunt, a very cool aunt of mine was visiting, and somebody had approached me and said, hey, Degrassi, and I had acted, uh, you know, in a negative, I sort of reacted like it bothered me, and mm-hmm. my aunt said to me, you know, those people are your fans, and you should respect them, I guess, <laughs> and if... it just, something just clicked, and ever since then, I've been, I really just tried to be very gracious about it, and, and, as a, and, and now that I've grown up with it, I, I now really appreciate my fans, and there I actually have a, a page, a, a Facebook account mm-hmm. for my fans, and they're just lovely people, and they actually wish me happy birthday more than my real friends. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's really nice. Well, that's that's amazing. I guess like because the time it gives you the perspective on the show and what it means to people, and you see that. Mm-hmm. But I can totally understand when you were younger how you would have been almost haunted by that. You know, a, a small part of your life. That's awesome that you can embrace it now. Yes, it, yeah. Well, yes. Thank you for empathizing. It would be it would be like somebody saying, it would be like somebody mentioning something you did when you were sixteen. Forever. Of course, yeah. Like, and uh, outside know. of my family, I'm lucky that no one else brings up those things. So. You see, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so but but there ha- there has been an, a positive side to it, and also the thing that's really struck me is that. I once got a, an, a message from someone on Facebook saying, you know, I grew up in, in, in the UK and I was gay and I was bullied all the time. And he said, you, your character gave me the strength to stand up to my bullies. Oh, that's so nice. I mean, who knew? <laughs> Especially, well, Steph, the, the character mm-hmm. you played, mm-hmm. she went through some, like, she had to go through some very adult situations mm-hmm. at such a young age age too did you have a grasp of that when you were making the show you mean in my personal experience um, or at, as yes you as a person making that show did you realize like the, the big issues at that time that she was dealing with well linda schuyler who is a teacher mm-hmm. before she became a producer used to i think she occasionally sensed that we were straying from our overall purpose like we were <laughs> having too much fun or we were just thinking about craft services or something and so she would occasionally bring us back and say guys you know the reason that we're the the importance of this show is that we are we are talking to people your age about issues they might not have anyone else to talk to about so she she tried to remind us that we were if we were grappling with serious issues it was for the greater good and at the same time, trying to get us to relate to them personally um, through our personal experience. So I was aware of this greater mission that the show had. I don't know if that's what you mean, but yeah, uh, I was aware of it. Okay, yeah, I, I mm-hmm. see exactly. And I think because, I mean, it was dealing with such serious issues in such a frank manner way mm-hmm. ahead of its time. And I think that's mm-hmm. kind of why I can still look back and just be like, wow, this show, like, you know, 24 years later, mm-hmm. they're still doing some things on that show that, I mean, even the next generation, um, the follow-up to the original 
I don't think comes even close to handling as well. Is that so? I have I could I confess I don't watch television. I'm one of those people. <laughs> oh, but that's okay. I'm surprised. I'm surprised. So you're you're saying they strayed a bit. You feel they strayed a bit from that original. I think mission. it's the the nature of that show just being a bit more glossy. I feel like there's a little mm-hmm. bit of there's like a grittiness mixed mm-hmm. with a cheesiness on the original that I yeah. don't think follows <laughs> yeah. through to the next generation. Right, right. I guess it was inevitable. Have you ever watched the show since being on it? Or maybe on it? You know, you I have haven't. It. <laughs> <laughs> is it on YouTube? Oh yeah, actually the whole series is on YouTube. If you mm-hmm. it's uh you can definitely find it there if you're if you're so inclined to take a trip back. I think I think you'd have fun with it. Uh I wanted to ask too about Steph's the character you play, obviously Steph's clothing that she was mm-hmm. wearing. Mm-hmm. Whose decision was that? Like <laughs> Whose decision was it to change at school to um, have that whole... No, I just guess, like, the clothing itself just seemed, like, so revealing and the makeup so bold. I'm <laughs> just wondering, any insight into those decisions at all? Well, the first thing that comes to mind, I can't remember exactly the details. For example, I didn't wear two tops. I don't know where those came from. <laughs> Some of the clothing was from my wardrobe. Mm-hmm. It was like an esprit. I have to stop saying like, first of all. Just <laughs> kill me whenever I say that. Um, there was <laughs> there was a, um, um, a, a green esprit mini skirt that was mine. <laughs> that, that blue, plastic blue purse with the white polka dots that was in the opening credits, that was mine. Oh, okay, yeah. That that's was a... also esprit. Mm-hmm. I remember because there was an Esprit store near my house that my mom really liked, and we used to shop there. Um, and then I don't know where the tube tops came from. My thought is that at the time, I was a dancer. I, I was pretty serious about um, dance. I took mm-hmm. jazz and tap, and I was, a, I was at a dance um, academy that did a show every year. So I would have been very comfortable showing my body but as, as, because of, as a dancer and as mm-hmm. an athlete. It's just you get a different you get a different sense of um, yourself and your body. So maybe that's why I felt comfortable with that at mm-hmm. that age. That's, that's my, my thought. Um, uh, Cause we, you know, we wore really like revealing little outfits when we were doing <laughs> yeah, our, was... our version of Michael Jackson songs on stage like, at the dance studio. So I was used to that. That's one of the weirdest part when I'm watching the show, you know, with comedians. I'm watching it with comedians, and we're usually mm-hmm. in our 20s or 30s. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And some of them are it just take, they're just like, whoa, I don't remember. It make, makes them feel weird watching the show with the third. Like, this is very revealing, and it's, it's funny. It's almost uncomfortable, which I didn't experience when I was younger. It was just a show, so it's funny how it changed. Well, you know, also, my, my I don't know if this would apply to me at that age, but my mother's European, and European women just have a different, they don't. They're not afraid of femininity. Mm-hmm. The way they, just the way they dress, the way they behave. You know, I had, I had a, I have an aunt in Paris who says, she used to say, la femininité il faut s'en servir, which means you must make use of your femininity. <laughs> and there's this sort of culture of, I don't know, I don't know if that, if if I was comfortable acting in that way or or being feminine, you know, maybe it comes partly from my European upbringing with my dance training, and then where that where that character came from. I mean, it, that might have been part of it. That might have been part of it because I did get a chance to look. Oh, first of all, it was a lot me, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, they weren't all. All these characters were not pure fiction. They were based you know, a lot on ourselves. That's something that I had heard. So that that mm-hmm. uh, that kind of came down that there would be sort of meetings between uh, the actors yeah. and the staff, and you guys would kind of talk yeah. about those issues and yeah, they would steal ideas. They would just steal our ideas. <laughs> just cherry picking. <laughs> So no writer yeah. credit either, eh? That's unfair. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm being, I'm being, you know, uh, cheeky, but. But yeah, you know what? Even perhaps. in like modern shows, like uh, like mm-hmm. Freaks and Geeks, which is an, another really uh, you know popular high school show that probably ended too soon, they would do the same thing, um, mm-hmm. mining from both the kids and th- their interests as well as the writing staff too. And mm-hmm. I think it makes mm-hmm. both those shows. There's something very real and something very natural to the to the actors as well and the and the whole the show overall. Yeah. That's right. That's probably where it comes from. And then the, I, I actually, in in preparation for this interview, I did listen to part of <laughs> the podcast about Kiss Me, Steph. Uh huh. Yes. And I didn't. I'm sorry, I didn't listen to the whole thing, but That's I, okay. I got halfway through. And somebody said broomhead. We never said broomhead. I don't know where they got that from. But that would be the writers trying to make uh... up make up stuff. What would be an insult that 
is would not offend the censors. That's what we pretty much assume. Yeah. But there was something like maybe that's because this also sounds very Canadian too. <laughs> <laughs> just like hey, it's a broomhead, eh? Or something. Yeah. What's the other one that we that comes up? Narbo. That seems like another made up one. That's absolutely. <laughs> I'm sure that's Yan. I can't remember his last name. That Yan, the, the the writer, the head writer. He would just make that stuff up. It would sort of sound like an insult, but wouldn't be real or, or offensive. Yeah, there's there's some of the lines that they that they say were just, mm. especially Joey Jeremiah, who gets like a lot of the weird jokes in it. Like sometimes they're only good because he's saying them. Like they're very bad. I remember that was a comment we had in a recent app. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I think they did a, they did a good job. Sometimes though, I think that's that adds to it now watching it where you're just like oh this is so ridiculous like it, something that would have seemed cheesier just seems funnier today well, I, I think what you're saying is it's kitschy i think exactly that's exactly it pitch, right mm-hmm. and i have to say i try to be natural i really tried i really tried to make the dialogue as natural as i could i remember i remember that specifically and i think i didn't want to sound scripted I think that shows through for the most part, specifically you. Some characters, especially earlier on, they're a bit more wooden. But, mm-hmm. I mean, you're throwing a lot. I mean, like pretty much everyone, it was one of their first first jobs, and, you know, it, I, it's pretty understandable. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's kind of the appeal, too, and what makes it kind of hold up over all this time, that it's natural performances. Mm-hmm. Especially in that first season, you were pretty much the main character as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was. Was it uh, was it set up that way when you were when you were brought on to the show? I'd had some acting training. Mm-hmm. I had gone to Young People's Theater summer camp since the age of ten, mm-hmm. and how I think I was thirteen when I did Degrassi. So I'd done three years of that, and I'd also done dance training, and I'd been on a couple of of shows. I, I did. I don't know if you remember um, Hanging In. I think that's before your time. There was a <laughs> there was a Canadian. Um, a Canadian sitcom shot in Yorkville, actually. The mm-hmm. studio was in Yorkville. And it was about kids who go to a drop-in center uh, for sort of marginal, marginalized low-income kids. And I, I, hadn't, I did an episode of that, and I'd done a couple, I'd done some theater. So maybe I was more comfortable, a little, mm-hmm. like just a tad more comfortable performing than, than, than some. I'm not going to say all. I mean, everybody, everybody, as you say, the, the show itself was a kind of academy, and we learned how to perform on camera over the years. They really did teach us the, mm-hmm. the, the skill. But I tried, maybe that's why. Mm-hmm. Because I, I had, maybe they thought I could handle it. Mm-hmm. And also, it, it was a great character. I used yeah. to say it was the Joan Collins of <laughs> Canadian TV. It was a great character to well, have. Well, I think so. It's like, especially in the first two seasons. Well, mm-hmm. definitely the first season. She's the main character. And like I said earlier, like, mm-hmm. her... Her storylines get really dark. Like in the well, mm-hmm. even in the first episode, that "Kiss Me, Steph," which is like pretty wholesome and nice, there's still mm-hmm. like guys literally banging on the door of the girls' washroom, yelling, "Give me a kiss! Give me like." <laughs> <laughs> and you're saying that's a little bit dark. I guess so. I mean, it it just seems like it wouldn't fly today. Like there would be a lot more <laughs> negative implications today. Even. Even the way that the it kind of, actually this is one way where you looking at with today's perspective it seems different because uh-huh. the show Steph dresses up this way and it's like her dress mm-hmm. is 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 making people say more sexualized mm-hmm. things to her mm-hmm. whereas mm-hmm. today it's more common for people to say hey you don't you know you're not going to say sexualized things to someone just because of the clothes they're wearing so it's kind of mm-hmm. it's interesting that's one way that it has kind of switched some of the aspects of the show don't necessarily hold up over time because some of the reactions to my dress seem a bit dated. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think that's probably true. I'm just thinking if I were a writer, I guess, and I wanted to increase the tension between me and Vula, which is what the sub, the sub one of the storylines was. That's right. Then if I had people banging on the door saying, I want to kiss, <laughs> it, would, it would make that that gap opening up in our friendship even wider. Mm-hmm. It would, it would, they probably did that for the benefit of that uh, that that subplot i'm thinking yeah what was the other yeah. one where steph <clears throat> steph very early she she's basically just setting up a second all right the or on her first day with wheels at the school dance she gets like so drunk which was an amazing acting <laughs> performance on your job playing that drunk 13 year old oh it, yeah it was really good on the episode we watched that everyone was like wow she did it 
pretty good. <laughs> Especially the moment when you're dancing, and uh, that's when you realize you get sick. It's pretty funny, actually. That episode's really good. <laughs> oh, thanks. Especially that second one. And and then when she's um basically almost date-raped by the soap star. Mm-hmm. That was yeah, those a, are the good ones. Those that are was the a, good ones. That one was pretty it was funny because the guests i had on the girl mm-hmm. remembered it as the date rape episode and the guy remembered it as the shoplifting episode so it just kind of shows <laughs> the two perspectives of memory <laughs> yes you remember what's important to you mm-hmm. <laughs> and because oh, the weirdest thing was uh he was fine he was fine when he thought steph was 16 but when he mm-hmm. was found out she was younger than 16 mm-hmm. she, that seemed like a problem that just seems I mean, no one would be like, oh, she's 16, that's okay. Like, it seems like that is a little outdated as well. Well, what is the law? Anyway. It is technically 16, but mm-hmm. I I feel like that's more in play for people who are in high school, like someone who pl- turns 18 is dating, you know, someone who's 17, that kind of thing. Somebody who's 17 is dating someone who's 15, and that's yeah. not okay. And then they, he turns yeah. 18, that kind of thing, or what, you know what I mean? Like, he turns 18 and she's 16, that kind of right. thing. Right. I feel. Um, I don't know. I'm, that's my interpretation of it. But it just. It, I don't know. It seems. If a 20 year old's dating a 16 year old, it doesn't seem right. Or a 25 year old in this case. Well, in, in this case, she was underage. No, wait. She was, she was 14 she was, or 15. 14. Yeah. Right. So she was underage. So he he knew the law. Good for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I guess the idea was to show Stephanie um, really still being a kid at heart. I and think so too. Getting herself into an adult situation that she couldn't handle and needing her mom. So I think that was supposed. To, I think probably they wanted to explore that that moment. Which I think they did. And that's the thing with Steph too. She's mm-hmm. always acting like she's so mature, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. when things and I guess that's kind of all the characters, right? Like everything is nice and good until something very serious happens, and then mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know it's a little less innocent. Yes. Yeah, I think that probably happened several times throughout the show. <laughs> I think it's a constant yeah. theme in the show. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah, you're right. Did you, fi- did you find that instructive when you were watching it? Uh, you have no idea. <laughs> I think you I think, w- oh, I better not get myself into that situation. Look what can happen. It's. I think my my perspective is all was like, okay, a show like Degrassi, w- I was watching in tandem with Saved by the Bell. Mm-hmm. They're like pretty much contemporaries. No one's nope. getting drunk on Saved by the Bell. Like, hmm. well, I guess they do eventually, but not like as commonly and casually. But now I'm making now it seems like I'm minimizing it. But it just seems like it was very realistic the way people were drinking. It just seemed like it dealt with very real issues that I could relate to. Like I could tell right. that Saved by the Bell wasn't what high school was going to be like. But I think Degrassi came closer. <laughs> well, that's good. That's wonderful. I was probably because I had seen the whole show probably before I was even in high school, mm-hmm. and continued to watch it then, which it mm-hmm. did start to begin get campy then because I was like ninety seven to two thousand and two. I was in high school, mm-hmm. so but I still think that I I took away lessons from it. For instance, mm-hmm. with uh, uh, Shane jumping off the bridge and taking acid, it made me realize the consequences from LSD. You know, you got to be safe if you're going to take it. Wow, that's great. <laughs> that's really good to know. I Just, missed that episode. <laughs> I didn't have an LSD either, so I guess I'm okay. <laughs> that's good to know. No, no, I still took LSD, but I was safe about it. <laughs> Just didn't jump off a bridge. Okay, didn't great. jump. You have to you have to see the uh, the consequences that could happen. <laughs> we saved lives. Yeah. Uh, but and a, a more serious one, or mm-hmm. watching you know Spike go through you know teenage pregnancy that you know the appeal of sex versus the direct consequences mm-hmm. of it shown mm-hmm. shown out very painstakingly over a few seasons mm-hmm. and into high school when she has the child that that mm-hmm. kind of thing you're just like mm-hmm. oh, okay I mm-hmm. think that so I think they yeah. So I think I did learn from the show. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And I don't think I'm alone in that either. I think a lot of people my age and people I've, you know, I have on the show as guests, uh, on the podcast as guests, like we all kind of, it resonates with us. That's wonderful. That's, those are, yeah, I hadn't thought of it before, but that is a really important lesson to try to connect. Make the connection, folks, <laughs> between intercourse and having children. <laughs> Well, if it would be a disaster that you had a child at this at this stage in your life, then you know take appropriate steps to <laughs> to avoid that. Yeah, no, that that's very good. I'm glad. I think it was a, a worthwhile project to be involved in. I'm glad I was part of it. Well, I want to thank you very much, Nicole, for for doing this interview and being on the podcast. My pleasure. 
Uh, do you have any anything you'd like to plug for music or anything at all, oh. or just like people to check out? <laughs> Anything I'd like to plug, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is I, I am now enrolled at the Humber Fundraising Management Program, and mm-hmm. so I'd like to, and you're a Humber grad as well. I am. I noticed that. <laughs> um, um, and I just want to plug that because they have a very high, the, the, the course has a 96% employment rate, so oh, I'm wow. plugging it because if you are just, if you are an undergrad right now and you're, you don't know what you want to do, but you think you might want to work in the charitable sector, which is actually the third largest sector after, uh, in Canada. It's bigger than the automobile industry because it includes all schools, edu- includes the education sector and hospitals. A very large sector. They need a lot of fundraisers, and it's a quite you know it's a it's a stable career. And so I'd like to plug that program. And they can just go on the Humber website and or just Google Humber Fundraising Management. Um, because I think it's a good a good educational choice. Oh well, that's fantastic. <laughs> um, I'm sure I'm sure some people will check that out. And mm-hmm. thank you for, again for uh, doing this interview, Nicole. And it's my pleasure, and thanks for keeping uh, keeping Degrassi alive. <laughs> and yeah. no problem. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I guess that's uh, that's everything. <laughs> and uh, yes. uh, we'll keep in touch. Have a good one, Nicole. That sounds good. Thanks, Tim, and Happy New Year. Oh, Happy New Year to you as well. Thank you very much. All right. Bye bye.